Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Verisite's iDimex 8 m Plus Leading System on Module Solutions, um, a collaboration between NXP and Verisite. I'm your moderator, Bosco Zhang from NXP Semiconductor. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Verisite has been part of our iDimex ecosystem for a very long time and is one of our selected premium partners in our NXP partner program. Verisite is a leading designer and manufacturer of a variety of SOM uh, system module focusing on our iDimex, iDimex processors. Um, they offer highly scalable pin-to-pin -pin product families, uh, production-ready Linux and Android software, and long-term longevity. Um, today, we have several experts from Verisite to talk to you about their recently introduced SOM-based uh, iDimex 8M Plus applications processor. We'll have the time dedicated for Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please take a moment now to find the question box on your GoToWebinar user interface. Please submit your questions in the question box at any time during the session, and our speakers will answer as many questions as time permits at the end. Also, if you like to follow along as we present our material, you can download today's presentation in the handout section of the GoToWebinar user interface. So without further ado, I'll ask Yari to begin his presentation. Yari? Hello and welcome to Verisite uh, webinar on the i.mx 8M plus based SOMs. My name is Yair and together with me we have Aviad Haddad who's a hardware expert in Verisite and Nate Rood from R and, our R&D and so, software and technical uh, sales. The webinar agenda will start with a short introduction overview followed by hardware, software, and a short overview on machine learning support in our SOM. Verisite is a leading SOM provider. We have over 5,000 customers from diversified markets. Verisite is the owner of its production line, so it allows easier customization if needed. There are ISO 9001 and 13485 certified, and we support long-term longevity and ecosystem to support a, and, a, and a large ecosystem which supports our customer, customers' designs. We are the only SOM vendor who is an NXP Platinum member. Design considerations of your SOM. When it comes, when you come and you have to uh, handle your design, there are a few questions you need to ask yourselves. These questions are what are the required interfaces? Do I need a PCI, HDMI, SDIO, and so on? Product size and limitation. What are the mechanical size? What are the limitations on the product? Does the sum fit? Which size of sum and so on? What is the power consumption? Is there any limitation? Is it battery operated? <clears throat> Do we need are some to enter have capabilities of entering sleep mode, for example, or is it connected to an electrical outlet? What is the memory footprint? How much memory do we need? For example, memory can be customized later on, you will see as an orderable option from Verisite. Processing needs. What are the processing needs? Because we have a variety of sums, each one with a different processing capabilities, then you can you have the ability to decide which SOM is best fit for you. And what is the operating system? We support multiple operating system, operating systems, and for example, Linux, Android, and more. You will see in the presentation. Is our, present, is our solution, does it require real-time operations, near real-time operations? This only affects our SOM solution and the scalability. At the end, do we need se several flavors of our product, meaning different processing capabilities and memory footprints and power consumption? As you can see, Verisite has two SOM families. One is the VAR SOM family, the one in the top row. And the second are SOMs from the DART family, which is a smaller form factor, which we'll see later. The, sc the scalability and processing capabilities <clears throat> ranges from 
Cortex A7 processing capabilities through A9 up to A53 processing capabilities. Now we are adding two new sounds which are based on the i.mxm M plus, which extend the scalability in both families. These two system on models, as you can see on the right one is the dot, the, on the top it's the dot and on the bottom it's the SOM. They have similar capabilities, but var varying interfaces, which you will see later. It is up to a quad 1.8 gigahertz uh, Cortex A53. It contains a neural processing unit which accelerates neural processing and provides up to 2.3 teraops. Display support is HDMI 2.0, LVDS, and DSI support. <clears throat> There's also a graphic accelerator of Vivante, the GC7000, GC52 and 520L for 2D and 3D acceleration capabilities of hardware and software uh, and hardware, so hardware decoding and encoding of video up to 1080p. The SOM supports dual gigabit Ethernet, supports USB 3, CAN, CAN FD, and has dual camera inputs, enabling working with two cameras simultaneously. And we have a built in certified. 802.11 B, G, and N, or a dual band 802.11 A, C, A, B, G, and N, with a, including a Bluetooth 4.2 BLE. These SOMs can be uh, purchased with up to 4 gigabit, a gigabyte RAM uh, on the SOM. Longevity we provide for 10 to 15 years. The SOM, as you can see, the SOM based, the SOM has all what is mentioned above on top of the SOM, and they're different in the physical size. The file SOM family is 67.6 is millimeters by 33, and the DART family is 55 <coughs> millimeters by 30. Now I will hand the presentation to Aviad, our health hardware expert. Hi, my name is Aviad, and I'm a hardware engineer at Verisite. Today we're going to talk about the IMX 8M Plus SOMs and how to design a scalable embedded product using them. We're going to explain the pin-to-pin -pin compatibility concept and pin mixing. We'll have a look at the Symfony board schematics, which can be used as a reference when designing your own board and also talk about some design guidelines. As explained, there are two pin-to-pin -pin families. The first is the DART family, and the second is the Varsom family. In this slide, you can see the orderable configurations of the IMX 8M Plus based SOMs belonging to these families. The configurations can be divided, divided into three main groups. The first is components, which are always assembled, such as CPU, RAM, or internal storage. Second one is interface controllers, such as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth model, audio codec, Ethernet controller, which are optional, and certain interface buses that can be exported from the SOM depending on an assembly option. Both the DART and SOM are able to export almost all of the various interfaces of the iMix ALM Plus processor. However, the SOM has a 200-pin SODIM edge connector compared to the DART, which has 390-pin board-to-board connectors. So in order to be able to export all the interfaces, the SOM has additional assembly options. I will be focusing on the VARSOM pin-to-pin family. The family members just... start from various sites, but true VARSOM MX6, going through the VARSOM 6UL, and up to the latest family of processors, the IMX8 and Mini, and the plus. The benefit of this family is that it's very wide, scalable, highly configurable, and with various choice of interface. All sums of the family connect to a single carrier board, a symphony board, which demonstrates the main features of each sum. So based on our experience with the need of the embedded market, we selected the compatible pinout, which provides the most commonly used interfaces 
and ensures that for all sums of the family, the main interface will be exported on the same pins. There are fully compatible interfaces, partially compatible interfaces, and some interfaces which are unique to specific sums. Taking, for example, the var sum mx 8 and plus block diagram, in blue we can see the fully compatible interfaces, and in gray we see the partially compatible interfaces. When designing your carrier board, you should make sure that the interfaces used are falling into the pin to pin standard in order to maintain compatibility with other sums of the family. Pin to pin compatibility is possible due to pin mixing, which is the capability of each ball of uh, type GPIO to be used for several different alternate functions. Uh, taking a look at the data sheet, we can see the main pin out table, which associates each CPU ball with the SOM pin as well as the assembly option in which this ball is exported. Some CPU balls are exported only on a certain, when a certain component is not assembled. There's also the pinbox table, which shows uh, the different alternate functions for each pin. And the data sheet also gives us the pinbox according to the interface breakdown, so you can determine from which pins a specific interface can be exported. To simplify the process of pinbox selection, we provide the compatibility spreadsheet, which has a dedicated pinbox tab for each SOM, showing the pinbox options available for each pin of the SOM. The spreadsheet also contains the compatibility pin map tab, where you can enter a pin number and see all possible pinbox options for that pin in every SOM of the family. There is also the most common function table, in which by selecting an interface from the drop down menu, you can see where there are common occurrences of this interface over all of the SOMs. For example, if we select UART from the drop-down menu, we can see in which pins there is a common occurrence of UART. The Excel also includes the Symphony board compatibility table, not shown here, in which by selecting a specific SOM, you can cross probe between the SOM pin and the Symphony board connectors pin. This makes it easy to evaluate different interfaces of a SOM using the Symphony board. So let's look now at the Symphony board schematics. In the schematics, you will see the main SOM page, which contains the SOM symbol. The off page connector naming indicates the compatibility level full compatibility, partial, or none. For each compatible pin, the compatibility list shows the alternate functions in each SOM separated by a backlash. The schematics also includes for each SOM a dedicated page with, with its connector symbol. If you're using OCAD, you can set the implementation property to the SOM you're using and then cross probe between the SOM symbol and the connector symbol. On the left here, you can see the dedicated SOM connector symbol for the VARSOM MX8 and Plus. And on the right, the off page connector naming. For LBDSA, for example, the off page connector's name connect, contains the pound symbol, which means it is compatible across all SOMs of the family. For HDMI, after page connector's name implies it is partially compatible. The display port and CSI signals, however, can be exported only on specific SOMs, and therefore they are not part of the off page connector name. So we have designed the Symphony board pinout so it will export the maximum compatible interfaces in all SOMs of the family. Uh, when coming to design your own board, I suggest, therefore, to start the design by adopting the EVK pinbook selection as a baseline for common interfaces you need, and then add additional, additional interfaces from the available pins which are left. If you need to use some pins for alternate functions which are not demonstrated in the EVK, verify first that these pins are not used internally by the SOM or are not exposed only in certain SOM assemblies. You can use the data sheet or the spreadsheet to verify this. Naturally, there are uh, incompatibilities between different SOM pinouts. The EVK schematics has dealt with most of the common ones. You can follow it uh, or use similar solutions to solve incompatibilities in your design. Regarding schematics, uh, the areas which are most error prone are the power, reset, and boot. I suggest to follow the EVK sections related to these areas as much as possible. Uh, in terms of boot config pins, you should verify they are not driven externally to an uh, undesirable state during boot. You can find the complete list of boot config pins and the state in the SOM data sheet. 
You should also uh, handle the reset. Uh, you can refer to the Symphony board. We use a, a supervisor for this, reset supervisor. In terms of power, uh, ensure sufficient power to the sum. The consumption figures of, uh, for typical use cases are listed in the data sheet. You can also measure on the Symphony board itself the consumption uh, by running and while running your specific application. Uh, pay attention to the design of the 3.3 peripheral supply rail and the carrier board supply rail discharge. And also, some pins have several voltage level options, so you should verify the voltage level compatibility. Uh, all these sections have been validated uh, for all sums so on the EVK, so it is uh, very highly recommended to you follow these uh, areas. Uh, a bit about the layout, the schematics and layout design source files are available on our FTP. You can download them and uh, use symbols, footprints, or placement. Uh, schematics is done in OCAD, layout is done in Allegro, but you can uh, import both to other tools. Uh, in order to place the saw mounting holes correctly, you can import uh, our layout or use the DXF files. Uh, which I've prov provided on the website. Um, if you're using a different uh, SODIM connector on your board than the one using the EVK, you should uh, uh, follow the SOMDXF for verifying the placement. Uh, pay attention if you're uh, placing components under the SOM, then check that there are no uh, height violations. Uh, in terms of stack up, uh, for a typical design, which uh, utilizes most of the SOM interfaces, I suggest a minimum of six layers. Uh, this will ensure uh, reference planes for all high-speed signals and uh, sufficient power planes. Uh, you can work with your PCB manufacturer to achieve a stack up, uh, which will give you all the needed impedances and uh, practical uh, trace dimensions and uh, reference planes. So as mentioned, the design files can be very helpful when coming to design your own board. Uh, design files are available on our FTP. The documentation is available on our website in, in the following links. Uh, we also have the wiki page for the software site, which will be explained up next. These resources uh, can ease the development process and uh, reduce time and risk. It's been a pleasure for me to speak to you today. Thank you for your attention. I will pass it on to Nate, who will discuss the software site. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Nate Drood. I'm part of Verisite Software Engineering Team. Uh, today, I'll be giving you an introduction to Verisite Software support for the AM Plus. We'll start by looking at our software wiki, which will show us uh, the VSP support we have uh, for the AM Plus. It'll also show us some of our developer resources. And I'll finish by walking through uh, several of our software guides for Docker, SW Update, and the Cortex M7. Okay, so this is a picture of our, our uh, wiki here. Our wiki is basically a website that our engineers are uh, constantly adding new information uh, for our software releases, release notes, build guides, and how-to guides. Um, all of the information is organized by SOM and by release. Uh, everything that I'll be presenting today, uh, for the most part, comes out of our wiki. So if there's something that's not clear or something you're looking for more information on, uh, you can head over to the wiki uh, after the presentation. Okay, so if on the previous screen you were to uh, click on our ADM Plus SOM or DART module, it would bring you to a screen similar to this. Uh, it'll show you the uh, BSPs that are currently supported for that module. For the ADM Plus, we currently support uh, Yocto Zeus with kernel 5.4.70. Uh, we also support uh, Android 10 with kernel 5.4.70. In the uh, coming weeks, we'll have support for Debian Bullseye, Boot to QT Zeus, and uh, FreeRTOS MCU Expresso, which is for the uh, Cortex M7. For each of our uh, releases, you can see here for Yocto and Android, we have a developer's guide. Uh, on the next slide, we will look into more detail at the developer's guide for Yocto. Okay, so this is uh, what the Yocto developer's guide looks like. Uh, you can see in the leftmost general column there, we have some getting started guides for using our recovery SD card and for how to build uh, Hello World C and, and uh, C++ applications uh, for, uh, for QT. Uh, we also have a link to our Verisite customer support portal, which I'll talk about more on the next slide. 
Uh, moving over to the build column, you can see we have many uh, build guides here. We have release notes for the Yocto release. We have a, uh, a guide for how to build Yocto from source code, uh, guides for how to customize U-Boot in the Linux kernel and how to build U-Boot in the Linux kernel from source code, as well as information about how to uh, add and remove packages to your Yocto image. And then down at the bottom, you can see the uh, SW update and Docker guides that we'll go through uh, later in the presentation. And moving over to the rightmost column, uh, we have many how-to guides and getting started guides for using uh, different hardware interfaces. So if you're trying to uh, use an audio speaker or get started with Bluetooth or CAN bus, or uh, even just something as simple as trying to toggle a GPI open, we have step-by-step uh, -step guides to walk you through that. Again, each of those guides are specific uh, to our SAW modules, so you don't have to search around to find that information. Um, I think these uh, these build guides and how-to guides are a great resource, and, and again, we have them available for uh, Yocto, Android, Debian, and, and all of our uh, software releases for each of our modules. Okay, as I mentioned previously, uh, Verisite has a, a, a customer support portal. Uh, this is a really great resource. It allows your uh, engineering team to communicate directly with Verisite hardware and software engineers. So if you're uh, stuck on something or looking for more information that's not available on the software wiki, you can always use the uh, customer support portal to uh, communicate directly with our engineering team. All right, now let's look at uh, Verisite software support for Docker. Uh, if you're not familiar with Docker, uh, Docker is something that's become uh, very popular in the uh, in the server world uh, in recent years, so a lot of uh, web developers are deploying Docker applications, uh, you know, like websites and databases, uh, using Docker containers on web servers. Uh, Docker allows you to basically build your uh, application into a container along with all of its dependencies in a full operating system like Ubuntu. It's kind of similar to a uh, a virtual machine. The idea is that you build a container for your application and it can run. Uh, basically on any hardware and software platform that supports Docker. So if you build an application with Docker, it should run the same on an Amazon server as it does on Verisite's evaluation kits. And uh, Verisite has seen uh, some interest in this in uh, recent uh, months and years. And so we've added uh, support for Docker in our Yocto and Debian releases. Um, this is uh, kind of an excerpt from our, our Docker guide on our wiki. Again, we support it uh, in Yocto and Debian. So for Yocto, we provide a Yocto image called var image docker that you can build and run. Uh, for Debian, uh, it's pretty simple to install Docker. So if you boot up a, docker, a Debian image, you can install uh, docker.io. So after, after you've uh, booted an image with Docker support, it's pretty easy to get started running Docker containers. Docker provides an online uh, repository called Docker Hub that has many pre-built containers. Uh, in this example here, uh, we show how to pull and uh, run a Ubuntu Docker container. As it says here, it only takes about eight seconds to do this, so it's it's very quick to get started. Uh, after running the, the Ubuntu container, uh, you can see we have full access to all of Ubuntu software features uh, in Ubuntu 20 in this example, so we can use app update and app install to install Node.js, uh, even running on top of a, a Yocker, Yocto environment. Uh, so Docker's Docker's is uh, pretty powerful, um, and it's it's pretty easy to get started uh, on Verisite's evaluation kits with Yocto and Debian. Uh, for more information about how to get started on Docker, uh, you can head over to our software wiki. We have a full guide there that'll walk you through all the details. Uh, we also have several links here to uh, online documentation from Docker that's more you know specific to Docker than it is Verisite. You know, let's look at uh, Verisite software support for SW update. Uh, it's become very common uh, lately for uh, products to require uh, software updates, whether it's during uh, software development or after products have been shipped into the field. Uh, to help support this, Verisite has included an example, a working uh, software update example in our Yocto layer called SW update. Um, SW update is a uh, Linux update agent that provides an efficient and safe way to update embedded systems. Uh, it provides all the features that you'd expect for an embedded update uh, system. It's, it's reliable. Updates are atomic, which means that uh, power loss or network interruptions won't uh, cause you to uh, run the risk of bricking your device. 
updates can be rolled back to a previous version uh, after an update if there's uh, some type of issue or problem. Um, update packages can be signed and then verified before installing so you can uh, know that this is a trusted update uh, coming from a trusted source. Uh, SW update is very flexible. It's it's more of a framework than anything else. Um, you can really shape it into uh, what your company needs. Uh, you can update anything from a single file to an entire root file system. Uh, in in the update or in the example from Verisite, uh, we show how to update an entire root file system. Updates can be done locally, uh, either through USB, the integrated uh, HTTP web server, or really any other local media like an SD card or, or Ethernet locally on a network. Uh, they can also be done over the air remotely using HTTPS uh, or uh, Hawkbit, which is a third-party device management system. It's open source. Or uh, again, you can you can customize SW Update to use any server protocols that already exist within your company if you if you already have a working uh, cloud solution for that. Uh, we have links here to our our full SW Update guide on our website, uh, as well as a link to uh, SW Update's website that'll go into more details. Uh, about some of SW Update's features. Uh, this slide here shows how SW Update manages to do the uh, atomic updates and rollback support. Um, I don't have time to walk through all of the details, but basically there's there's dual root file systems and the updates alternate uh, between the two root file, file systems so that you're never uh, modifying the file system that you're booting from. And after an update, you can always revert back to uh, the other file system if there's if there's some type of issue. Again, this uh, this is described in more detail on our software wiki, as well as on the SW Update website. Okay, now let's look at uh, Verisite software support for the Cortex M7. Uh, just a quick reminder, the ADEM Plus SOC has up to four ARM Cortex A53 cores that are typically running uh, something like Android or Linux. Uh, it also has an ARM Cortex M7. Uh, the M7 is, is really good for uh, real-time applications uh, that have low latency requirements or deterministic uh, operation requirements. Uh, example of this might be trying to phase fire uh, a triac using a GPIO pin or a, a motor control algorithm. Basically, any kind of uh, uh, software support that you need to be real time or software control that you need to be real time uh, that you're not able to do in something like Linux or Android, uh, writing firmware for the ARM uh, Cortex M7 is a great application for that. So, software support for the M7 um, NXP uh, basically provides a, a release called MCU Expresso SDK that has many example projects for their evaluation kits. Uh, Verisite ports uh, these projects over to our evaluation kits. As I mentioned earlier, we'll have a release uh, in the near future for the ADEM Plus. So uh, this here is, is actually uh, showing our ADEM Nano uh, MCU Expresso release for the M7. Um, here you can see there's uh, example projects. There's a Hello World project, which is a great place to start. Uh, there's a directory with driver examples to show you how to get started using uh, different drivers like I2C and PWMs. Uh, there's a directory with multi-core examples, which will show you how to communicate uh, between the A53 and M7. So if you want to know how to uh, send messages from a Linux application to your firmware running on the M7, there are several examples to show you how to do that. And there's also a directory uh, with uh, RTOS examples, which will show you uh, several different flavors and configurations of free RTOS and how to get started using free RTOS. Okay, so I wanna walk through real quick uh, how to build and run uh, the Hello World demo that I described on the previous slide. Uh, I'm not gonna read through all of the commands here, but but the big picture idea is uh, is first to download and install the uh, ARM toolchain uh, and then to uh, clone free RTOS's, uh, I'm sorry, Verisite's free RTOS release using Git. Uh, after we've done that, we can uh, change directory into the Hello World project and run a build all script, which will produce a hello world.bin and hello world.elf file. And what we're going to do is install that hello world.elf file to slash lib slash firmware on uh, Verisite's evaluation kit. So in the previous step, we, we downloaded a uh, hello world project, we compiled it, and we installed the, uh, the firmware on an evaluation kit. Before we can run that firmware, 
uh, in Linux, we have to uh, use a, a dedicated M7 device tree file. This device tree file has to disable any resources that are being used by the Cortex M7. Uh, in this example, the Hello World uh, project is going to print Hello World on uh, UART3. So from Linux, we need to make sure that we're disabling UART3. Uh, you can see at the top here, we use uh, FW set environment to configure U-boot to load a uh, device tree file that's already configured from Verisite uh, for the M7 and, uh, and reboot the evaluation kit. So again, just to, to recap in the, the previous two steps, we downloaded, uh, compiled, and installed uh, the Hello World firmware on the evaluation kit. We configured the evaluation kit to uh, boot using a dedicated uh, device tree file for the M7. Um, here we can see how to uh, load and run that, uh, that firmware file. Uh, we can do that using Linux's uh, remote processor framework. So what we have here is a, uh, a terminal with, with two serial port consoles. The leftmost console is connected to the Linux console on the A53, and the rightmost console is connected to uh, UART3 on the Cortex M7. And again, we can, we can load and run that firmware using uh, the remote processor framework. To do that, we change directory into slash sys class remote proc remote proc zero. And uh, after that we're there, there's there's several files that uh, basically provide an interface for us to control the M7. Uh, to load the firmware in step two, we can write hello world.elf to the firmware file. Uh, and when we do that, it'll load the firmware into the Cortex M7. And in step three, we can start that firmware by writing start to the state file. And when we do that, we can see Hello World printed on UART3 on the Cortex M7. And uh, we can restart that firmware in step four by, again, writing stop to the state file and writing start to the state file. And again, we'll see Hello World printed to the Linux console. Uh, so it's, it's pretty easy to uh, get started running these examples on Verisite's evaluation kit. Uh, we have the full guide on our software wiki uh, for all of our, our SOMs that support uh, this coprocessor. So uh, for more information, just take a look at our wiki and you can walk through that full guide. Well, thanks for your time today. I'll uh, pass it off now to Yair, who will talk more about uh, machine learning and AI on the 8M+. One of the new features being added in this uh, SOM is the support for accelerating machine learning algorithms. We'll have a short overview, scan applications, why machine learning on the edge and the software support, an overview about the software support. Artificial intelligence is a field which deals with computers' ability to handle human intelligence tasks. Sub, subsets, subsets of this field are machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning is based on neural nets, which has gained a lot of interest in the last years due to breakthroughs in research and computation capabilities. Deep learning algorithms can be applied in fields like video surveillance and security, in cases where we want to apply detection and recognition, for example, of objects or people, the smart vending machines, robotics, especially in computer vision applications, when you talk about autonomous machines, which require uh, computer vision, decision making, recognition, image segmentation, and so on, all these can be supported by deep learning uh, algorithms. Audio processing, for example, is another field which is being handled lately <coughs> with the deep learning algorithms, and also in finance or uh, networking, looking for anomalies on the network. Why machine learning on the edge? Because of bandwidth and latency, neural nets processing requires a lot, handling a lot of data. And we want to require it, and if we want to process it on the back end, then we will spend a lot of efforts transmitting information up to the back end and or to the cloud and receiving the data. This will consume a lot of time and uh, power and so on. Also security and data privacy. We don't want necessarily to transmit the data, so we prefer to process the data on the edge and only 
what is the outcome of this processing to share outside if needed. Also decentralization, instead of having a, 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 a remote large system which consumes a lot of power, we can distribute the processing uh, among several units if we have to distribute it in the field. Cost effective, not necessarily we need a lot of processing power. So uh, processing power like two, two to three teraops may be sufficient for many deep learning algorithms. Availability, no matter if we are connected or not connected to the network, this processing capability is on the edge. So there's no uh, worry that we will not be able to process what is needed. Also customization. Uh, neural net can be trained to this for specific data and we can actually optimize the algorithm to be supported on the specific uh, processing unit on the edge. And redundancy. Let's say we have several uh, units in the field which each one operates independently, so the ability to process on the edge will support the redundancy need. What is the basic neuron? The basic neuron is the function which you see before. There's an activation function which operates on uh, actually what you see is a dot product uh, between weights and an input. <clears throat> this is, as mentioned already before, deep learning is a subset of machine learning and neural nets actually learn for, from example. The neural nets are used for classification, segmentation and detection and they are highly co uh, computation intensive. On the right hand side, you can see two types of networks. One is shallow network, with the, that which top one is a shallow network, which does not require a lot of processing and generally even can be processed by a CPU. But the modern networks today are deep and they contains a lot, a lot of many layers. And here it comes to high processing needs, which are also required on the edge. How is it supported on the IMX 8M plus? There's a neural processing unit which supports, uh, which accelerates these computations. And the supported frameworks, which are commonly used in, uh, in the market are TensorFlow Lite, ONX, ARM neural nets and OpenCV, and they're all supported on the IMX. 8M uh, device. To summarize, uh, the two SOM being introduced today from various sites provide a highly advanced and integrated solution with Wi Fi and Bluetooth support, dual Ethernet, CAN and CAN uh, flexible data rate, Ethernet. Uh, it is an application processor which actually incorporates also real-time capabilities and neural processing capabilities with support of multiple uh, OS options. You may contact us through our website or sales at verisite.com or through the Verisite portal, VeriWiki, and you can also grab our releases from the GitHub release, from releases we place on our GitHub. Now we can move to the questions and answer, and thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, Yair um, and uh, Aviad and, and Nate for all the great information. Um, we do have quite a few questions that came in. Um, first one, I believe this goes to Nate. Um, M7 can be programmed using either onboard A53 or um, using an external computer directly? Um, I know you can use uh, JTAG to load firmware uh, into the M7. Otherwise, you can load it uh, using the A53 from U-Boot or from uh, Linux using the remote processor framework as we showed uh, in the presentation. 
um, I guess it's similar um, in, in the using M Cortex M7 cores and A53 cores. Uh, what would be the best way, what would be the way to exchange data between A53 cores running Linux and Cortex M7 running RTOS? Yeah, as I as I mentioned, there are uh, there's several example projects that show how to use the the messaging unit um, from Linux uh, from a Linux application uh, and the uh, the Cortex M7 firmware. Uh, so I would um, I would recommend taking a look at several of those example projects. Uh, there's you know depending on what you're trying to do, what type of messages you're trying to send, uh, there's several ways to do that. Uh, so I think the uh, the best place to get started there would be to head over to the wiki. And uh, look at some of our guides. Uh, probably right now for the for the Nano, uh, the Atom Plus guide will be coming out soon. And uh, also NXP has uh, has a lot of documentation and, and uh, you know reference examples as well for how to do that. But I think it depends on what you're trying to do. And I would I would look at the example uh, applications for that. Okay, great. Um, I think you you've already addressed, but what program what programming language can we use for application development? C or C plus plus, Python, Java. Yeah, so it's uh, I'm assuming this is talking about from uh, is this from Linux? Do you, do you know which environment this is from? Um, yes, uh, I, I mean there was a question, but I, I believe it I, would yeah. be. So so from from the Linux environment, uh, we basically have you know, support for any any programming language supported by Linux. Um, so yeah, C, C++, Python, Java. Uh, we saw in the example, you can run, you know, Node.js if, if uh, you're interested in doing that or basically anything supported by Docker. Um, so anything, you know, that's supported by standard desktop Linux uh, should also, you know, any language supported by standard Linux should also be supported by, by various sites, Yocto and Debian images. Okay. Uh, and uh, a couple of questions on the kernel. Uh, is Debian with standard kernel and is Linux vanilla kernel included, including all drivers? Uh, so Verisite recommends uh, using our kernel, which is based off of uh, NXP's release uh, for the 8M Plus. So, so uh, NXP provides a kernel with, with drivers and all the support necessary for the 8M Plus and Verisite has ported that to our hardware. Um, there's also a community kernel that we use for uh, for many of our other SOMs, uh, that's constantly updated with uh, with the uh, mainline kernel. Um, it's not available right now for the ADM Plus, uh, but it will be, I believe, in the future. And uh, Debian, so Debian and Yocto, to answer that question, both use the same yeah. kernel uh, from NXP. Okay. Um, and I think this is the last question I have for Nate. You, um, what would be the best ID environment to start developing C C++ application for Yocto image we previous, previously built? Yeah, so uh, Yocto will uh, produce a SDK that you can use uh, for compiling your applications. That SDK can be used in several different IDEs uh, like Eclipse or uh, VS Code. Uh, if you're writing a Qt uh, application, C or C++ Qt creator is a really good option. Um, but really, uh, that SDK can be integrated into many different IDEs for uh, development and debugging uh, mm -hmm. remotely. So I, I, I think there's some good options, and it's probably up to the customer's preference uh, and experience. OK, great. Um, so this one, now it's heading over to Aviad for the hardware questions. Um, so the question is, um, you know, the customer is, states that they are having some, um, they're starting with a small team without any hardware knowledge. So they're asking if you provide ready to use carrier designs for various applications such as camera or IoT form factor. Yeah, we basically we have all the uh, design files in our uh, FTP, uh, which you can uh, actually import to your uh, tool, and then uh, either, either the schematics or the, the layout. So uh, it, it will include all the the symbols and the footprints and the uh, the bomb the information. Uh, on top of that, uh, we uh, through our portal we support uh, customers during the design stage. So uh, if people have uh, questions regarding pinboxing or uh, uh, wanting to verify violations uh, of uh, uh, interfaces, um, we we 
provide support on that. Uh, and also after the customer produces his board and has a prototype and starts debugging, uh, we, I mean, we, if people encounter problems, uh, we uh, do a review on the uh, schematics and try to uh, uh, solve the issues and uh, almost all customers uh, are uh, able to bring up their board successfully and uh, use the sum for the purpose they need uh, very easily. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, another question for you, Aviad. Uh, can you provide more details on exactly what six layers minimum is recommended? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, when when you have uh, high speed interfaces and uh, many power planes, uh, um, it's, it's uh, it would be easier to uh, provide the uh, the high speed signals uh, uh, um, reference planes if you have six layers uh of uh in, in the board uh if you i mean if you use only uh, one or two interfaces of the sum then you can do it with four layers but uh, our board uh, uses uh, a six layer stack up uh makes it easier and also the uh the the the, the traces will uh be routed easily Um, are there any analog inputs at their disposal on uh, in Adamx ADAM family that they can use to measure uh, the analog voltage by the help of ADC peripheral? There's no uh, analog input uh, from the CPU, but there are many uh, uh, translators from uh, uh, I2C or SPI based that uh, customers use. Uh, to to have analog uh, input capability. But there's also drivers for these uh, uh, chips available. Um, so the next question, sorry. Um, to, uh, do you recommend to use vertical 90 degree connector for Varsom? Uh, it all depends on your, uh, um, on your design, uh, we use a horizontal one. You can uh, fasten it uh, also with the studs. Um, but there's also different heights of connectors. I mean, uh, the customer can choose whatever suits him. Uh, there's no uh, limitation. Mm -hmm. OK. So I think this one is sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, when will the Dynamax 8M Plus modules be available for development and production it goes to offer? Yes, so uh, practically they are available uh, now. You can uh, already get the evaluation kits both for the Dart and the Varsom uh, models. From Varsite, we're still uh, a bit selective due to, I uh, would say, limitation on the quantities that we get on also from NXP. But uh, we already ship uh, from, uh, let's say, Q4 and naturally in Q1. And now that Q2 is uh, moving uh, forward, we are moving more and more into normal uh, production stage for uh, both of those models. So you can place the order now. Depends really on the priority. We can ship either in a matter of week or uh, maybe later. Um, and this one, I think, would be either Yair or Aviad. Um, can you share a benchmark for the MPU, like MobileNet SSD? Um, we we cannot share now, but uh, I know NXP has an application note which shows the benchmark, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but any, in any case, you can take the TensorFlow benchmark and just run it on the target and uh, apply it to the networks you can download. There are many quantized 8-bit networks which you can download and use the benchmark utility of uh, TensorFlow Lite. Okay, great. Um, another question. Um... Does the Android build also support the neural accelerator MPU and the core processor M7? I think this goes to Nate. 
Yeah, I'm uh, I'm actually not familiar with the uh, Android support right now for the MPU, but I know that uh, the uh, M7 uh, it uses the um, that same kernel remote processor framework, so we should be able to load firmware into the M7 uh, from the Android side as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not. I'm just not familiar with uh, MPU support uh, in Android right now. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's something you can address or, uh, or if that's something we'll have to follow up with. I think it is. As far as I recall, it is supported also in Android. Okay. Um, so this question, um, I think this also goes to offer. Um, how about the performance between? No, sorry. Uh, this one goes to Ari. Um, how about the performance between TensorFlow Lite and ARM and N on iDynamics 8 and Plus? Um, working on, they are working on the TensorFlow Lite and uh, was wondering if, um, you, you know, uh, the, the performance of the two. And they're asking also, can they program the MPU like they do on NVIDIA GPU using the CUDA? As far as I know, the MP MPU cannot be programmed. There's a library which what the, the libraries of TensorFlow Lite, ONNX, uh, and other packages which are ported to uh, the NPU. Uh, but these libraries can, can, only these libraries can be used. The, it's not programmable by the user of the NPU itself. Okay, great. Um, sorry to go back and forth, Nate. <laughs> um, is it possible to access some functions from the Docker container? Yeah, so um, Linux Linux uh, device devices can be exported uh, inside of the Docker container. Um, there's uh, basically command line arguments that you pass to the Docker container to export resources from Linux or you know from the host operating system to inside of the Docker container. So like a serial port or an I2C interface or something like that can absolutely be uh, exported inside of that container. Great. Um, so, and there's also sort of business uh, related question, I guess Offer can answer that. Um, what is the MOQ where you can start customizing the options of the module, example, memory, storage, Wi-Fi, et cetera? In general, we provide a relatively low MOQ of 100 units uh, for such customization. Since we have our own uh, internal production lines, uh, one of the advantages of our site <clears throat> is the capability to, to customize and optimize each and every uh, customer-specific requirements of the model. Uh, but even as an exception, we provide for uh, NPI phase, the customer still uh, wants to ramp up to production then we provide a one-time exception to the MOQ of 100, then we can even put, provide something like 20, 25 units for the customer that uh, say one time wants to build the prototypes. So this is more or less the MOQ that we are talking about. Naturally, we still keep stock items that the customer can use in MOQ of one, but those are not customized and optimized for the customer specifications. Okay. Um, and also, these modules will ship from Israel, correct? Yes, from Israel. Totally vaccinated, as you know. <laughs> yeah, you guys are leading the the percentage of, of population being vaccinated. So. Yeah, we have a special deal. If you buy 1,000 units, uh, we give you a free vaccinate uh, for uh, COVID. <laughs> Um, so another question um, goes to Nate. There are a lot of software questions. Um, can Verisite BSP support CI uh, slash CD? Uh, yeah, so there are um, there's different tools, I guess, for doing that for, uh, you know, you could use like Jenkins or GitHub um, actions to, uh, to do that. Um, not sure how to uh, put scope around that question, but but yeah, I mean, I think you can definitely do that uh, using some of the tools that are out there. Okay. Well, I think um, there there's a lot more questions. Um, I'm, I'm trying, having a hard time following up with all the questions coming in. I, I think this is great. Um, so this question is more, I think, um, you, you need to have more intimate discussion with Verisite, but the question is, 
how is it what is the best uh, way to provide carrier board power and are the timing issues with the board's peripherals coming up? Do we need, man do we need to manually do this via a GPIO pin? I would assume it'd be Aviad. Yeah, the, the power, uh, I mean, uh, it depends what family does uh, the dot and the sum. Some operates in uh, typical 3.3 uh, voltage. Uh, the uh, dot has a wider range, where, which can also uh, suit uh, battery applications, up to 4.5 volts. Um, and what was the continuation? It was a long question. Oh yeah, there there is a. Do we need to manually do this via a GPIO pin? GPIO. What to enable power? In order to enable power. Yes. And in the timing issues when the board peripherals. Uh, we we use a, a FET on our uh, schematics, uh, which uh, times the uh, supply of the power to the carrier board. This is uh, very recommended because it uh, provide. Uh, prevents backfeeding from the uh, uh, peripherals to the CPU uh, before the uh, rays are powered uh, on the sum. So uh, all that area of the 3.3 uh, volt, uh, the reset, the discharge uh, uh, which we added to the schematics, uh, this, this is very uh, recommended to follow. Uh, there's no need to invent stuff uh, because we already validated uh, uh, these uh, critical areas in our schematics. Yeah. Great. And uh, one a couple, we have a couple of minutes left um, if to offer. Would it be possible to ship hardware loaded with customer's image? Yes, it's a very good question. It's a standard. We ship the modules with uh, our own standard U-boot, but we do have the option to preload the specific image during uh, the production phase, actually just after the SMT line. During the final test, we have the option to also preload the customer-specific image with his own uh, specific part number, and we ship everything preloaded to, to the customer uh, with the image inside. So yes, the the answer is simply yes. Okay. Um, and are, are there some uh, machine learning examples on running uh, that are running on iDimex 8 M Plus available from Verisite? Be offered or uh, no. currently the standard ones uh, provided by NXP, but we are working on a few. Okay. Great. Um, we got one more question, time for one more question. Can Verisite BSP support container-based deployments? This one goes to Nate. Yes, I'm assuming we're talking about uh, Docker here. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we can run Docker containers uh, in our, our Yocto and Debian images. Um, for deploying or building it into the image, uh, Yocto recipe, you know, to include a, uh, a pre-built Docker container would have to be written, so you'd have to write a, a, a Yocto recipe uh, in your Yocto layer, I think. And then for uh, maybe deploying them remotely, you could you could have a um, you know a server solution similar to Docker Hub, where you could pull those uh, container updates down, um, if if that's what you mean by how to deploy uh, containers. Okay. Um, sorry, I, we couldn't get to all the questions that were submitted. Um, please refer to the contact information. Um, Yari, if you can go back to the slide with the contact information. Um, please send your questions uh, to sales at verisite.com or to bosco.jung at nxp.com um, to get any questions answered. Um, thank you again for attending and uh, have, hope you have a great evening afternoon and day.